All right, welcome to human-friendly privacy policies. Um, glad to see so many of you uh, online. So my name is Tarmo Toikkonen, work for Forum Virium, which is an innovation company owned by the city of Helsinki. And I'll just briefly tell you about stuff we've been doing around trying to communicate privacy policies and how companies are using people's personal data, how to do that in a, in a well, human friendly way or understandable way. So how the how we how this session is organized is that I will be presenting uh, a toolkit that we've uh, developed and, and show um, an example of, of, of an application that's be, that's been uh, designed using the toolkit or the principles of it. And but that will be quite brief. So I'll only be talking by myself for maybe 10, maximum 15 minutes, hopefully. I'll have one video to show you as well. And then we open up with a panel with, with a very nice selection of, of various uh, views around human-friendly communication. And uh, we'll go from there. And I do encourage you guys to post, of course, use the chat, but also post questions in the Q&A. We'll pick those questions there for the panel to, panel to answer. Uh, once I've done my initial presentation. All right, so here we go. So just have to say that again, you know, uh, good stuff done with EU money. So this is a smash it project that's been paying the wages for for doing this exploration into into communicating privacy policies. So thanks to them. Um, but essentially, when you're thinking about, okay, how do you tell people what you are doing with their data? If you're, you know, developing an online service or an app or whatever, whatever, it, working with customers, working with citizens in, in a city and you're developing services that could be very physical services, how do you communicate these to people? Well, first of all, a few sort of general observations. Uh, first of all, Having a 20 page legal text for people to scroll through and then click on agree is not good, is not actually according to the spirit or, or text of the GDPR. GDPR talks about informed consent. So people should be informed of what they are, what, what is happening to their data, and then they can decide whether they want to allow that or what aspects of that use they want to allow. Um, and having 20 pages of text nobody reads is not informed consent. So, um, so that's the first thing. So, uh, while a legal department might say that yes, this is how we cover the company's risks, and now it's all good. In fact, they've achieved nothing in terms of actually communicating with their users or stakeholders. Um, another observation is that. Agreeing to privacy policies or, or use of personal data is quite often or almost always it's a secondary task. People are trying to do something else. They're trying to register to a service. They're trying to, you know, enter into a contract or something else, uh, and and then this is on top of that. So usually, people aren't willing to put in the time and effort to uh, really pay attention. So that sort of tells us that how we have to communicate this is that we have to um, help them um, pay attention, pay at least a little bit attention. Uh, the third point is that you know legal text just doesn't work. No one is a legal expert. And well, legal experts of course are, but even legal experts will not read through, let's say, Facebook's privacy policy, unless, unless they're being paid to do that. I mean, that's not fun for anyone. Um, and uh, what this sort of boils down to is that people are busy. People don't really care, many of them. They just want to get on with the primary task. So it's essentially it's impossible to ensure that everybody understands all of it and agrees with full uh, sort of informed consent that just won't happen. You can't get to 100%, but you can get to something better than zero, which is what you get with that long legal text that that nobody reads. So it's possible to 
summarize and simplify things so that people understand at least the gist of it. And that's better than nothing. And the final point, I think this is a, a quite an important point as well, is that um, when you are designing how you communicate, you're summarizing, you're highlighting some things and not highlighting some other things, that means that you cannot be fully objective or, or it's impossible to objectively display everything because you are making decisions on what you highlight. And that means that you can you can be good or you can be evil. Um, you can hide the nasty things that you're doing with people's data into the small print, or you can highlight them that, yes, we are also doing these kinds of things. So um, it's, it is, it's good to be aware of that, that as, as a communication designer, you can mislead people or you can make them, make people more aware of what is happening to their data. And, and that's good to keep in mind, I think. Um, so we started working on these uh, privacy communications um, a few months ago. Essentially, we're looking at, okay, could we use icons uh, and, uh, or pictograms to, to, you know, really summarize things into just sort of like, you know, as you know, Creative Commons, you have your couple of license logos and that, that, that should tell you everything. Um, and the sad answer is that, nope, we're not there yet. But we sort of then expanded there. Okay, so what can we do to make these things more understandable, uh, simpler, faster to skim through? And um, collecting these um, design solutions or different techniques you can use, just, you know, in the end, we counted them, there's 19. So we have 19 design solutions talking about structuring, language, visualization, engagement, and privacy. And uh, yeah, Dixon, uh, yeah, asking for a link. There's a link, uh, there's QR codes. We'll, we'll share the links to you guys so you can download it. So this, this toolkit actually is published right now during this session. So you got, you'll be the first ones to be able to download it. So uh, the picture there is from a mobile app. That, that was designed with these principles. And if you look at that, sort of, uh, you can see that there's a few sentences of a highlight first, like, like an overview, okay, this is what we're doing with your data. Then some important things that we decided to highlight. For example, we are saying that we do not use your data to sell ads, or we are not targeting you based on that. Uh, I mean, we don't really need to say that, but that is something that we chose to say that that's not something we are doing because we think that's a positive sign, positive message to convey. And you can see that we're using folds to hide details. So the whole thing is two screens on a mobile phone, a two and a half. And then if you're more interested, you can open up uh, some of the folds and get to the details. Um, but uh, sort of uh, having this layered approach and sort of skimmable skimmable um, brief content seem to be something that works works uh, better than you know what we're used to um, right um, so the toolkit consists of a reference manual although that that's a big word it's uh, there's lots of improvement to be done to it but definitely it's it's still you know it's a good starting point it also comes with a design canvas that you can see here um in case you want to work you know in a physical room with a group with your group of you know you have your legal facilitator and then you have your comms developer as uh, and others and then think think about okay so what is the data we're using you collect the facts on the left then you think about how to simplify those purposes that you're using it and and what details you'll want to want to then present and it refers to the various design solutions in the that are in the manual. So that's sort of the structure of the toolkit. Quite simple, quite straightforward. Hopefully something that, that helps um, service developers to you know, think about and, and improve on their privacy, um, privacy communications. Um, let's see. Um, all right, so now might be time for a, a video and uh, 
excuse me, I think I need to switch the sharing to something else. Let's get the uh, video going. So the video will be in Finnish with English subtitles. Um, there we go. So this is uh, essentially a trailer for the app that was de designed around the one minute mark. You'll see the user using the onboarding process as well. Here we go. City Feedback App-sovelluksella annat helposti palautetta kaupungin korjaustarpeista ja suosituksia kivoimmista paikoista. Kaupungilla liikkuvat ihmiset huomaavat yleensä ensimmäisenä, jos jotain pitäisi korjata. City Feedback Appin avulla voit ilmoittaa erilaisista kaupunkiympäristöön liittyvistä havainnoista heti, kun huomaat ne. Sovellus mahdollistaa joukoistetun tiedonkeruun. Sovellukseen tehdyt ilmoitukset näkyvät kaikille ja kirjautuneena voit luoda omia ilmoituksia. Osa palautteista välitetään Helsingin kaupungin palautteen käsittelijöille toimenpiteitä varten ja loput jäävät käyttäjäyhteisön sisäiseksi tiedon jakamiseksi. City Feedback Appin avulla voit raportoida esimerkiksi täysistä roskakorjattuneista kylteistä, rikkinäisistä penkeistä ja puutteellisesta liikenteen ohjauksesta. Saat ilmoituksen, kun asiasi on otettu käsittelyyn ja vika korjattu. Sovellus on tarkoitettu palautteen antamiseen ja kaupungissa liikkuvien yhteiseen tiedonjakoon. Sillä voit esimerkiksi jakaa toisille vinkkejä ja suosituksia. City Feedback App noudattaa yleistä tietosuoja-asetusta ja omadataperiaatteita. Käyttäjänä sinulle kerrotaan avoimesti ja läpinäkyvästi, mitä tietoja kerätään, jaetaan ja mitä tarkoitusta varten. Voit myös perua antamasi luvan milloin vain niin halutessasi. City Feedback Appin testaus alkoi huhtikuussa 2022 osana Smash Hit-hanketta, jossa pyritään edistämään datataloutta luomalla uusia ja parempia palveluja, jakamalla dataa turvallisesti sekä sujuvoittamalla lupakäytäntöjä datan jakamiselle. Sovellusta kehitetään käyttäjäpalautteen pohjalta. Lataa City Feedback App ja kehitä kaupunkia ympärilläsi. All right. There we go. So the app is currently live in Helsinki. Um, people around the world not in Helsinki can also of course, can also you know use it, although it's maybe not you won't be able to send your information to your local city official. Uh, Let's see. Uh, all right. Trying to reshare the reshare the uh, presentation. Just a second. Here we go. All right. All right. So final thoughts. Um, some things we've learned during this uh, this process. One, um, so this might be interesting to you. So one was that uh, um, sort of a, the idea that not just handling the, the consent giving that's mandated by GDPR, but also other things that we are asking permission from the users or, or let's say things that we can make optional for the user uh, that aren't directly related to their privacy or their personal data. Uh, the idea that let's you know ask all of those using a similar user user experience or user user interface, because the average user doesn't really you know think about okay this is privacy and then here are the other permissions but it, it's all the same so it makes sense to use a, a consistent UI there. Um, we've also talked with uh, um, at least uh, two different lawyers checking you know the results of this type of design and uh, and uh, and they've said that yes looks very good of course always improvements have been made but essentially the message is that yes doing a privacy policy that's just you know eight sentences long and and very very um, brief is valid is is something you can do and it, legally it it works so that's good news of course 
Um, as I said, uh, having, having everything visual with icons, we're not there yet. It's a bit hard to come up with a pictogram that, that discusses abstract things that, that, we, that we work with when we're talking about privacy. But that may be something that, that, that comes in the future. And there's, there's, of course, various initiatives going around looking at how to, how to standardize and how to come up with, with shared visual symbols for these. But I guess in the end, it's uh, it, it really what is needed is a, is a sort of a big shift in how companies are doing this because all the companies are sort of following the American model that you know here's the you know, 30 pages of legalese and that you, you just accept that and and there's no choice. Um, it would be very nice to see a, a big shift there to towards more human friendly uh, communications around this. And I guess that that happens. Partly, if we, as users of these services, um, you know, demand better. Um, that's sort of the um, sort of the uh, observations I have for those. So the city feedback app, um, you can test out, test it out yourself. Um, there's a QR code. Uh, we'll put out the links links as well, so you can install the app. And try out the registration process. See how 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 it feels to do do the constant giving, and whether it's a better experience than than what you're used to when having to agree to terms of use and so on. There's also a built-in feedback function in there, so you can send feedback about the app to the developers, including the onboarding process. Whether it's understandable, whether there's something that you felt could be better, all of that will be very much valued and will be um taken into use um and that's it um i'll i'll share the the link to the link to the android app on the chat as well um but yeah that that's that's sort of the uh call to action that's something you can test out immediately um and um that's it um Let's move on to the panel. So uh, uh, I'm delighted to, to be joined with, by Ariana Rossi, Paolo Bello, Mika Leivo, Jarno Ritari, and Eva, Eva Leppanen. So we have legal scholars, we have, we have uh, designers, we have smart city representatives, and we have software developers here. And, um, and that's, I think we have, um, yep, we have audio here. Um, so I don't know, maybe um, maybe I'd like to, let's see if there's that. So now is a very good time to start posting questions in the Q&A, but maybe maybe um, I'd like to, maybe I'll start with Paula. This is gonna be, nobody know that they don't know what's going on. So maybe I'll start with Paula. I, I know you worked a lot with, with UNICEF and thinking about how to talk about these things to children. And, and, and um, so that's of course, a good case for making things very clear. So, Paolo, any any um, reflections on this, and uh, that you'd like to share with us right now? Uh, well, first of all, thank you, Tarmo, for the great work that uh, you have done. I think it it you really succeed in making a very complex situation uh, uh, manageable or feel manageable. Uh, I think many companies, when they see your guide, are able to figure out what they have to do. So, so that's a bit, very big uh, step uh, forward. I actually posted a question in the, in the chat of, is there a future where we can just set the rules of, uh, and that comes from my family. These are the rules of my family. This is how you can, uh, uh, how I consent my child to work in the digital world. Do you comply with those? Welcome to our family. If you don't comply, Bye bye. That's it. Because the situation now is as ridiculous. If the digital world would be a city, is a place where to cross the street you have to sign a contract. To enter a shop, you you have to write a, a sign a contract that you don't understand. So it doesn't really make sense at all. In the perspective of children, it's even worse. And that's why why I uh, I am here today and in the next session because the situation of of consent and empowering children uh, digitally, it's really impossible for those 
of us who have the task of uh, protecting them. Uh, understanding the terms for a child is just impossible. And uh, I have an example of a couple of weeks ago, uh, I have allowed my child, and I'm going to use names of, of companies, sorry about that, but it's the only way that people can understand what I'm talking about. In a law, uh, um, law conference, they were talking about the, this exact issue, how to manage the legal framework for children. And one in the audience asked, is there any platform that we can think it's safe for children? And the lawyer said that the one that had the most fair terms for children was uh, YouTube for children. So my child has that. I set it up with the age thing and so on. And one day he comes to me really curious because he had um, looked at something of Minecraft and now everything was Minecraft. So he told me, isn't this funny? He's six. Mm. And I was like, what is this? This is not supposed to happen. And this means that, you know, your data is going somewhere and so on. And he was really confused, like, data, what are you talking about? So I had to explain, someone understood that you like this and it went to a brain somewhere that we don't know how it works. And that's why the brain decided that more things of Minecraft should be uh, pushed to you. Uh, and he was really confused and he got really upset about it. He said, so I'm not going to be able to see other things that I like wow. or other, other things. And I think it uh, materialized, that case materialized what happens to companies that don't understand the importance of communication and being straightforward with what they do because they lost both our trust. My son, who's six, <laughs> and my trust. So just by not clear, being clear, what are they doing with that? Mm, indeed. Mm. Uh, and I don't think they will recover, at least from uh, YouTube, it's, uh, we still use it sometimes, but with other very different approach. So this is something that uh, our companies first need to understand, why are we collecting data to start with? In the cases of children, there is very, very few reasons what they should, should do that. They shouldn't, in my opinion. And I think Lego is a, is a good example that they don't collect data of users of the, of the sites because there is children. And uh, 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 that is the first thing. Why are you doing that? And the second thing, if you fail to do this properly, you're losing not just one person, you're losing trust. And that's fundamental to thrive in the uh, uh, digital worlds in the future. Mm. Right, indeed. So very good example of... of not being clear about, yes, we're using your viewing preferences to recommend you other videos. And yeah, and then actually failing, the, the user feeling that they've been cheated. So very good point there of the importance of doing this right. Um, maybe uh, I'd like to next next get some reflection from Jarno or Eva, who were the developers of the developers of the city feedback app how do you feel about this uh, privacy design i know it took a long time there was a long series of of workshops getting 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 it getting it to where it is so what's your um, experience of the process and how do you feel about as a as a software developer what, of what the added value there is yes so maybe i can start with with our project so of course, the main principles when starting uh, our feedback application with this project was that uh, a good privacy design, of course, leads to a safer user experience, where one of the main principles is to utilize end user data in compliance with good GDPR practices. And we wanted the end users. Uh, feel confident and well informed about how and for what purposes their data is used and how it is processed. Uh, I think that the biggest challenges we had is uh, or were that um, how to identify the personal data that is used in application that requires explicit user consent and on the other hand what kind of data usage and conditions can be described more generally in the application's terms of services. But also at the same time, 
how we could avoid, avoid the constant fatigue, but still make the end user feel safe about how the personal data is used, shared in the application environment. Hmm. Uh, for example, uh, we made a decision that the feedback content itself is not a personal data, but the end users still need to be informed in terms of service that they should not include any privacy sensitive information in the feedback itself, such as names, personal identification numbers, etc. Uh, and also guiding users that the possible photo attached to feedback should not include identifiable persons. So as we design this application in compliance with yep. good GDPR practices, we paid attention that the end users can feel confident and well informed about how and for what purposes their data is used and, and how it is processed. And a granted consent is required from users to collect and process their personal data, such as email address and their current location information. And also a grant is required from the user so that we can share their feedback with third parties, such as city authorities. Uh, in the terms of service, uh, we described uh, the terms of services in a clear and comprehensive manner, uh, containing information, for, for example, about user rights and responsibilities for proper usage and expected functionality of the application, uh, guidelines for accept acceptable content for the provided feedback, uh, copyright information, and privacy policy outlining the use of the personal data and also conditions and provisions regarding the user account processing and handling, etc. cetera. Uh, as uh, Tarmo already mentioned, we also got uh, consultation by uh, Olli Pitkanen, who is a Finnish IT law, IPR and data protection expert. And uh, if we got good feedback, how the consents and terms of service are introduced and processed in our application. So basically, it is uh, something that, as a summary, how, how we wanted to con consider the, the GDPR practices when designing and implementing our feedback application. Yep, indeed. Thank you, Arne. Yeah, I do remember that there was a lot of thought that you know, how many purposes are there. If there's, you know, 20, no one's going to, as you said, constant fatigue. And if you summarize it to one, then yeah, that just yeah. means, yeah, we're just going to use all your data for whatever. So you have to find the balance yeah. of what's what's the, what's salient. Yeah. And, and, and what, yeah, and and find the balance, uh, what is the consented data itself and what you can describe in the terms of service, like mm. in more general, but but still precise and good way. Mm, yeah, that was also sort of thinking that, well, I mean, yeah, there's a gray line that, that something is clearly privacy, pro like personal data, something is clearly not. And then there's this gray area that could be considered. But, so, that, yeah, that was sort of the, one of the points I made that, you know, just anything that, that people agree to just make it, handle it in a consistent way, you know, not with no need to worry about whether it's mandated by GDPR or not. And that makes things easier for the developers as well. All right, Eva, do you want to add anything to what Jarno was saying? Thanks. Jarno said a lot, but I also remember that, that in some ways we noticed that even for a small, small number of data items, it can easily become complex if there are different purposes and different stakeholders for each of these data items. So some kind of highlighting and grouping of, of those must is, is important. Uh. So keeping somehow the level of detail suitable and, and how to visualize it to the user it's it's a challenge yeah indeed that so I, something that perhaps wasn't said that part of the smash it project is that there's actually a whole semantic layer and sort of this constant management framework and and, and system behind it and it sort of relates to the uh, the dpv semantic models and all those things and so it's not just that we we just you know show some 
checkboxes for the user, but it also actually all maps it down to the legal concepts. So yeah, that that's sort of a thing you have to think about. Okay, so these are the the legal facts, but how do we group them? How do we explain them to the end user in an understandable way? Indeed. Um, all right, let's um, let's go next. I'm 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 saving Ariana for the last because I I know she has a series a lot. But Mika, from the point of view of um, you know um, from a, for a smart city point of view, you know developing um, services to citizens. I know in Helsinki we sort of have, I guess we have the good fortune of people generally trusting the city and the sort of public sector officials that we are trying to do what's best. Uh, that's not the case in everywhere in the world, but still I think that, you know, achieving trust with, with, with citizens is, is quite important. So Mika, any, any thoughts on uh, from the point of view of a city developing services? <clears throat> yeah, well, of course, uh, one point is that uh, we really need to be very straightforward and uh, clear in, in what we require of our uh, citizens or, or customers. Uh, one point also, of course, is that uh, there's a disparity of power between a citizen and, and a city. So mm -hmm. we have to be very careful on, on what the GDPR actually uh, allows to be done with a consent or, or, or how, how that kind of things should be arranged. Uh, one thing that uh, clearly is, is a problem from, from a city point of view, and I think some, some people here have also seen, seen that, that problem more generally, is that uh, there's a huge number of, of consents, there's a huge number of, of, of uh, ticks you, you have to place in the boxes. Uh, and when we had a uh, city as a My Data Operator project last year, uh, we also did, uh, commonly with Turku City, a uh, small research project on how people would like to see their uh, consents or this kind of, of things. And uh, it came rather obvious that they don't want this million ticks in a box, but they want like a tree. So that when you kind of like, if you trust the uh, thing that you are trying to do, or, or kind of like you want to say that, okay, for this kind of purposes, these groups of data, that's okay, click and then be able to see what's, what they are used for and, and when and how and why and, and by whom. And uh, this was actually a quite clear that, that people actually want this kind of, of like, well, some people say it reverse, uh, but, but I, I would say that, that a group, grouped way of doing is, is, is what is needed here. And one thing in, in the city, like we have several hundred different services, many of which are digital and many of which require some kind of personal data. And uh, in this environment, of course, the consents become very, very, very cluttered very fast. And then, for example, we have a child in a school and then we would need a consent for taking photos of, of that child, maybe sharing those photos with his uh, or her peers and uh, maybe maybe like uh, using them for some some kind of a school publication maybe and so forth or then there's like this uh, photography session for the class which needs a separate permission because it's it's a uh, commercial activity and so forth and so forth and so forth and each and every one of these traditionally is done by a piece of paper hmm. so within a year we have like well a thick stack of papers, every one signs, and mostly they are like uh, very, very uh, crumpy and uh, wet and <laughs> yeah, often dirty brought, brought because... to school by children. Yes, indeed. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and, and uh, often there's also the case that the the child calls home from the school that oh, I need this permission now. Well, they are almost crying because they want to do something and then they don't have the permission because they forgot to ask it because it was a piece of paper in the bottom of the bag and so forth. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and, and then how do you actually 
remove that consent? How do I tell the school not to take more any more pictures of my kid? How yeah. do I remove my consent of doing something else which I've given out on a paper? So we kind of like turned this into a digital uh, consent management service so that now a person who consents to something uh, can do that safely and digitally. And for the kid also, we have a system of checking that this person is actually a guardian of this kid. So we can consent for our children, for example, for some city services or taking pictures or whatever. And those consents can be withdrawn and they can be seen. What, what were this year's consents and why did I give them? Mm. So, so I think that's one way of, of easing this burden of, of uh, things, concentrating them, making them in groups, digitalizing them, and again, giving one access point to all those concepts so that you don't have to remember, okay, it was this city feedback, was it Arctic Circle? No, no, that's, that's mm -hmm. the Santa Claus, what it was. So you have one place to go and then you can like, see and remove and do stuff so i think that's that's my point here that it would make people's lives easier if that kind of system is is uh taken in use more vital and on the like how you describe the consents i think you have a very good point here uh making simple and understandable text, short, simple, understandable texts is as good or better than having a 25 a force of text. Of, often the uh, legal people want to, you know, list everything out, uh, but, you know, we kind of like have to fight them and say that, okay, you, can, you should be able to put it in five sentences. And then if you really, really want then you can have have the long explanation with all the uh, all the legal stuff in the, like mm -hmm. like you know the actual law text there. But you should make it so that that the simple version is the uh, primary version. Yeah, indeed. Very good points. Thanks, Mika. Um, and yeah, indeed. Uh, I'm glad that. It's, from your comments, I sort of recognize several sort of design solutions in the in the in the toolkit. So for like this salient grouping and also sort of this like interactive privacy policy when you test, okay, what if I allow this? What would happen? We could you know show this is the new service or this is what the service would look like if you enable this or if you disable this, how things work. That it, it it's more work, but again makes things more more understandable. Um, there's lots of good questions fly, flying in in the in the uh, comments, but I, I, I'll, I'll f now give the floor to Ariana. I've I've communicated with Ariana several times and uh, read quite a large chunk of her uh, or academic publications as well. So Ariana has been working a lot with thinking about visualizing privacy and 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 just legal design in general. So Ariana, please um, comments and criticism are more than welcome. Yes, hello and hello everybody and thank you Tarmo for inviting me. Um, I'm very happy to be here and to be, uh, let's say, being able to to comment on the great work that you've been doing and also it's great to hear what is happening, for example, in Helsinki. Um, I think there is there is a lot also early, earlier today at the conference, there were many insights that I think we can we can really build on top. Um, and I think that, uh, first of all, I, would, I wanted to praise your your work because I think it's super, um, it's super timely and needed what you're doing um, because there is a lot of guidance that is needed um, and uh, with the DGA now there are a lot of new obligations posed for example on, on data intermediation services um, about I'm sorry for the phone that is ringing in the back I, I hope you can hear me we can <laughs> of hear course you. it never yeah. rings the phone at home but it does now but mm -hmm. uh, that, that's what happens anyway I hope they're going to, to leave it soon uh, so what is very important about the Data Governance Act is that in terms of trustworthy um, mechanisms that they try to uh, push forward there is a lot of 
emphasis on consent, informed consent, and how to transparently uh, communicate with all the, let's say, the actors of the data economy. Um, the, the, the challenge, of course, is that there are a lot of problems and issues that have not been solved yet. So uh, again, uh, of course, there is, there is an emphasis. It means that we have new energies and new motivations to work towards uh, solving those challenges. But, but uh, for those that work in the area, uh, we know that uh, many of those are, are really unsolved challenges. And I don't know, I think there are certain solutions for other um, problems. Maybe they are more wicked. Uh, we need to find new solutions. And I will co come back to this later. Um, what is interesting about the Data Governance Act, and I think there is a relevance here, is that there is also this possible, this, this, let's say, this um, uh, requirement of of, uh, of um, designing a standardized data altruism form. So, of course, how do you get it that right is going to be super, very, super important. Um, and there are going to be also new obligations on uh, data intermediation services to provide the tools, easy to use tools to give consent and withdraw consent. So, it, you know, it all loops back, let's say, to what we were saying. Um, there is also um, what, what you have mentioned before that is also very interesting because you mentioned something about uh, the fact that the design choices are never neutral. Mm -hmm. So when you take a choice, um, th th there is also, of course, uh, a choice that you make from an intellectual point of view, but also from an ethical point of view. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, this is very important to highlight because, um, yeah, uh, it's impossible to get to that neutrality, um, but it's also very easy to um, go from nudging users into something beneficial for them, into nudging users into sharing data for other kind of purposes that are not so beneficial for them. And we speak a lot about their patterns. So in my unit, research unit, we do a lot of work related to transparency, uh, legal design and dark patterns. Um, and I think that everything, so, there are many actors that are going to be impacted by your work or this kind of and similar work. Uh, it's not only about companies, of course, but speaking about public administration, I see the same challenges in the research domain. So working with researchers when we do uh, studies with users, how do we communicate effectively? Um, and maybe this is something that could be uh, made a bit more clear in the in the toolkit. I see many different stakeholders that could be really that could find it very beneficial. Um, but of course, who is in charge of privacy communication in different contexts is very varied. Right? There is not like one person in charge of that. And sometimes mm. they also dodge the ball or they pass the ball from one the hot potato from one team to the other, and then the collaboration doesn't work. It's it's like in in data protection compliance more in general. I mean, I mean, many different, let's say, uh, roles and, 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 and also departments sometimes need to speak to each other and collaborate. Um, and that's, um, that's also a challenge. Mm. Now, um, maybe another point I wanted to make is that um, the content is also very hard to get. It's not only how you how you present certain information. That, of course, is, is very important. I've been working on that quite a lot. But I also fear that uh, there may be um, what has been called uh, by my colleagues, at least, uh, legal design washing. Mm? It means that you make a certain communication aesthetically pleasant. Uh, but And then, of course, most people will not treat it. Most people um, will see it as something that is trustworthy just because it looks good uh, and there is a lot of research showing this in other domains as well um, and then you know maybe you can hide a lot of very nasty uh, or you know privacy pra uh, invasive practices inside so I think that there is a lot of guidance on the on how do you get that content um, uh, who is in charge of that uh, what is actually happening in your organization how do you uh, how do you collect all of those insights and how do you put them into the privacy communication that is also going to be something very important to solve um, and maybe just as a as a, as a final comment, um, uh, what uh, I wanted to relate to what Paola was uh, was saying before, which I think is very important. Um, so, um, the, 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 I think that what also is very needed, and your guidance would be one of those resources, is really a lot of um, guidance from different actors in different languages as well, which needs to look trustworthy. Okay, so it must be trustworthy. It must be made by experts, many different experts from different uh, domains as well, working together. Um, and uh, so uh, it needs also to be a bit more strengthened, I think, uh, in your toolkit, the fact that we're speaking about compliance. Okay, we're not uh -huh. only speaking about suggestions. Uh, these The things that you're uh, suggesting 
really also help organizations to be more compliant with legal requirements. Um, and I just want to mention uh, an initiative that we are uh, carrying out with the Italian Data Protection Authority. It's a white paper on transparency. Um, I also see that there is Deborah De Angelis here. She is, um, because we're working on uh, not only with Italian DPA, but also with the Italian Creative Commons uh, chapter on work on, on trying to provide best practices, trying pr to provide guidelines, uh, um, on how could we uh, make sure that the transparency communication about uh, around privacy is more effective and we also look into sticky policies. I think this is what Paola was referring to. So is it possible under certain conditions, for example, when the legal basis is consent, to determine how I want my data to be used. And, and there is a lot of research in the area, this discussion, especially I think that the my data community has been doing, going on for quite a while. Um, th there are also technologies being um, developed uh, lately. There is Solid, for example, so you can set your privacy preferences about your data and then um, establish ways in which other entities accessing your data must respect the permissions and the authorizations that you give about that data. Of course, here the problem is it's very difficult, especially for individuals, to make sure that their best, that their interests are taken into consideration. And also, how do you know, right? What actually you want other people to do with your data? I mean, you need to be an expert most of the times. And even if you're an expert, what does it mean being an expert? Okay, with my health data, I'm not such an expert, even if I would say I'm an expert in many other let's say, mm -hmm. data uh, privacy uh, context. And this is where I think we need a lot of automation, actually. Uh, so otherwise, those things are never going to be usable by anybody. Um, and uh, well, I, will, I will leave it here. I think there is a lot of work that needs to be done, for example, in terms of international standardization, in, ter in terms of interoperability, in terms of machine readability uh, of what everything that we are saying now. Um, uh, there is a lot of fragmentation that we need to really overcome. Uh, but uh, maybe um, just to finish on a final point is that what I really praise also of your of your um, toolkit is that is in CC BY. It means that you know it. it it contributes and everybody can contribute to the open science and we can build on top of it uh, to uh, create uh, similar initiatives uh, in which we really co-create all of the tools that we need to make the data economy a reality. Indeed. Thank you very much, Ariane. Good point there. So indeed, the toolkit is not ready, even though it's it's published and looks nice. There's, there's certainly a lot more that can be done. And as you said, it's pu published as open content, so anyone can go ahead and you know, improve on it. I definitely, I've started working at, at, the, uh, at the Finnish Innovation Fund Citra, where I'm working on in the realm of fair data economy. So essentially this very thing. So we will definitely be re, you know, finding new uses and developing this further as well. Um, but definitely, you know, welcome anyone to, you know, not, not just download it, but also see how you might want to improve, translate, make use of it elsewhere. Uh, it's CC by SA, so just go ahead and, and remix as you will. Um, we are running out of time, but any uh, sort of uh, floor is open. This uh, everyone's seen the questions coming through. Um, so if, if anyone wants to pick up on any of the questions, any of our panelists. Right, the, oh yeah. <laughs> Yes, using sounds to denote the relative level of safety. Um, it's a good point. There's also uh, something that's not not published yet, although that's something that probably should be done. Done a bit of review of different things. I mean, there's quite a bit number of you know browser extensions that will do things like color code, you know, web services based on their privacy policies. And there's there's of course, since it's not all machine readable, there's lots of lots of uh, you know crowdsourcing and AI and things like that doing that. But um but yeah, haven't thought of using sounds that that's certainly an interesting in yeah, I mean essentially, I mean if you go to a to a bad site and you get an annoying sound that you might just leave. That might actually be very <laughs> effective. <laughs> All right. Any final remarks from from our uh, uh, panelists? Uh, next steps. All right. I think we are. Yep, yeah, we are out of time. But hey, please go 
come to the Forum Virium Helsinki booth uh, here in the conference area. We'll be there. There's the link, download links and all that, and we can keep the discussion going. Thank you very much for your time and attention and excellent comments. Uh, we'll be sure to uh, make and you know record all of those. Um, and yes, do be in touch with any of us. Uh, you know who we are. You know what we do based on this brief brief discussion. So thank you all and and talk to you later. Thank you. Have a good day. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye.